Sister Snyder, we'd like to get to know more about you. Can you please first tell us how you got the truth? I was introduced to the truth by my parents, and Jehovah used the example of my sister and the nurturing love of older ones in the congregations to draw me to Him. Then how did you start in the full-time ministry and then into Bethel service? Well, it was a bit of a test. When I was in my late teens, a friend of mine died, and I couldn't understand why Jehovah would allow this to happen to such a kind person. So an elderly pioneer sister encouraged me to do deeper research on the issue of universal sovereignty. And this not only comforted me, but it uh, caused me to reevaluate my priorities and to see if I truly believed Jehovah would take care of me if I really put Him first. So I started pioneering, put college on hold, and it wasn't long before I was broke and the rent was coming due. And so the next meeting, I quietly put my last $50 in the contribution box and thought, that's it, I'm done, doesn't work, I'm going back to school. But that evening, I learned that Matthew 6, 33 is undeniably true. Jehovah surprised me and cared for all my needs from the most unlikely sources, and He hasn't stopped caring for me since. Oh, well, how nice for you, Sister Snyder. Jehovah is caring for you. He didn't care especially about your friend who died, did he? A friend of mine died, and I couldn't understand why Jehovah would allow this to happen to such a kind person. And that never gets answered, by the way. We just get this vague explanation that it's something to do with Jehovah's sovereignty. But bottom line, did Jehovah care for this friend of Sister Snyder's who, who died? Difficult to argue that Jehovah cared for the needs of 7,500 Jehovah's Witnesses who have so far died due to the coronavirus pandemic, according to the organization's own figures. And that number has almost certainly risen since we were given it. But, oh, don't worry, Sister Snyder's okay, so everything's fine. Seriously, viewers, I, I do talk about this now and then, but it keeps resurfacing, so I keep having to talk about it. What arrogance. This is the arrogance that you need to have if you take seriously this idea that not only is there a supreme being who's taking an interest in humanity, but also that that supreme being is looking out for you in particular. He's interested in you. He's interested in your success, your prosperity, how much money you've got in your bank account, whether or not you need to go through higher education. But he sat through the Holocaust with his arms folded. I once thought that way. I obviously didn't connect it to the Holocaust, but I allowed myself to be so arrogant and self-absorbed that I thought the creator of the cosmos was interested in my particular well-being. I had an experience when I was actually ironically going through college as a Jehovah's Witness. I went to college for two years. I was crossing the road to get the bus into college and I got hit by a van that was not just any van but one of those armor-plated vans that collects money uh, from ATMs and that kind of thing. It would have been driving about 30-40 miles an hour and it hit me and in front of everyone who was on the bus I'm told because I don't remember too much about the exact impact but I'm told I went flying and amazingly despite being in that sort of accident, I was able to just pick myself up off the road and get on the bus with everyone looking at me as though they'd seen a ghost. 
and the bus driver said, you went flying and here you are on my bus. And that sort of, I played around with that incident in my head for years afterwards and I was thinking, that surely, that surely was was God's intervention. How can I explain that sort of thing? I now look back on the whole thing and think, well, if that was God's intervention, again, where was he for the Holocaust? Where was he during the massacres in Bosnia or 9-11? Or where was he during the various atrocities committed by ISIS? Where was he for all of that? To believe in divine intervention on a personal basis over such menial things as how much money is on your bank balance and whether you're able to pioneer or not, while ignoring all of the suffering, all of the nine million children who die every year before they can even reach the age of six years old, it requires you to either just not be thinking properly which I think is the case with most people who think that way. They just don't think it through. Or it requires breathtaking self-importance and breathtaking arrogance. And that's exactly what we're seeing here. Quite apart from the fact that she's sending a message to countless young people who'll be watching this, oh, you don't need college, you don't need uh, higher education, and if you've only got $50 left on your person, if that's your last $50, that needs to go in the contribution box. I mean, there's, there, there's multiple layers of cringe in all of this. I realize this. But for me, it's just the arrogance on display here of assuming that you're that important. You are so important in the grand scheme of things in the unraveling of God's plan that your bank balance matters more than millions of victims of various atrocities going through history. I also found it interesting where she said, The next meeting, I quietly put my last $50 in the contribution box. So the next meeting, I quietly put my last $50 in the contribution box as though oh, I was doing it in a very inconspicuous way. I, I quietly put my $50 in the contribution box. Well, it's not so quiet now, is it? <laughs> Millions of Jehovah's Witnesses are hearing all about how wonderful you are, Sister Snyder, and how faithful you were to put that money in the contribution box. So I'm not sure whether you did it loudly or quietly is frankly relevant in any way. Now, what assignments have you enjoyed at Bethel? I've enjoyed housekeeping. I really enjoyed a lot of assignments within transportation department. And I was one of thousands who worked on the Warwick and Tuxedo construction projects. Now, as the wife of a branch committee member, you have a demanding schedule. Can you explain one challenge? Well, like most wives of good shepherds, I would love to have more time with my husband. Mm, that's understandable. So what practical things have you done to deal with that challenge? Well, prayer, study, and meditation has reminded me that we're at spiritual war. And we're at war, our priorities have to change. So I can't long for ideal circumstances, although they're coming quickly. <laughs> right now, it's about advancing pure worship. And while it's important to maintain a healthy and close relationship with Troy, my primary joy should be in Jehovah. Now, with challenges come blessings. What's one blessing you enjoy as the wife of a branch committee member? Increased peace that comes from having complete confidence in how Jehovah directs and blesses the decisions his organization makes through the governing body. Um, if I were not married to a branch committee, Member, I may never have known um, just how much the brothers rely on Jehovah's Spirit and um, how much time they spend, long periods of time in prayer, and how much they deeply, deeply love their friends. So I'm embarrassed about how much worrying I've done in the past about these things, but now it's a lot easier to just be supportive and uh, listen, obey, and be blessed. Listen, obey, and be blessed. Good grief. 
Well, I think you should be embarrassed, Sister Snyder, but not about how much worrying you've done in the past about these things. There's multiple layers of embarrassment there, mostly the fanaticism that you're displaying. And don't get me wrong, I don't want to be too harsh here, because let's remember, Sister Snyder isn't in full control of her own mind at the moment. That's kind of self-evident when you look at the sort of phony, contrived way in which all of this is coming across. None of this looks for me particularly heartfelt. She's like a puppet on strings as far as I'm concerned. She's saying what she's expected to say. She's. We're never going to hear in answer to the question, what's it like being the wife of a branch committee member? Oh, it's a bit rubbish, really. I don't really like it. Uh, I'd rather... <laughs> I'd rather not be the wife of a branch committee member. She's going to gush about all of this. So let's cut Sister Snyder a bit of slack. However, we can learn a lot here. And we're learning all about, again, how fanatical this organization is. Sister Snyder says... We're at spiritual war. And we're at war. Our priorities have to change. So... I can't long for ideal circumstances, although they're coming quickly. We're at spiritual war. And we're at war, so our priorities have to change. So I can't long for ideal circumstances, although they're coming quickly. By ideal circumstances, she means I have to forego having a proper relationship with my husband. I would like to spend more time with my husband, who's a branch committee member and therefore is very busy, no doubt putting out fires caused by the mishandling of child abuse in the United States. I'd love to have more time with him, but I'm at war. I'm at war with Satan's system of things. So it would be selfish of me to think about what my needs are as a wife. It would be selfish of me to expect to be able to spend time with the person I'm married to. I just have to go along with it all because I know that at least when the paradise comes, I'll get to spend some time with my husband. That's pretty much what she just said. That's the level of fanaticism you need, especially if you're going to make it in the higher echelons of this organization. I love as well the question, what's one blessing you enjoy as the wife of a branch committee member? Again, highlighting just how exclusive all of this is. I mean, this isn't something that ordinary Jehovah's Witnesses, especially ordinary Jehovah's Witness women can relate to. They're cherry picking from among the top brass and they're expecting us all to nod along and think, oh, yeah, I can relate to that. <laughs> and they say, you know, what do you enjoy as a branch committee member? And she says, um, if I were not married to a branch committee member, I may never have known um, just how much the brothers rely on Jehovah's Spirit and um, how much time they spend, long periods of time in prayer, and how much they deeply, deeply love their friends. If I were not married to a branch committee member, I may never have known just how much the brothers rely on Jehovah's Spirit, the brothers meaning the governing body, and how much time they spend, long periods of time in prayer, and how much they deeply, deeply love the friends. If I weren't married to a branch committee member, I probably have no idea <laughs> just how devout and just how loving and just how prayerful the governing body are. But because of this unique privilege that I have to have married a branch committee member, I've been rescued <laughs> with this knowledge because I get to rub shoulders with the governing body I get to see how much they pray. 
<laughs> yeah. Whenever the governing body members are praying, Sister Snyder's there in the corner of the room, like <laughs> with a stopwatch. How many how many minutes will it be this time that Brother Morris has got his eyes closed? <laughs> how can you possibly know? How can you possibly know, Sister Snyder, how much they're praying? No one can know that. For all you know, Tony Morris has just fallen asleep in a drunken stupor. <laughs> but apparently Sister Snyder knows that these men pray. And she knows that they really, really, really love the brothers. Because that's something you can only really know when you're the wife of a branch committee member. As you look back on your rich spiritual life in Jehovah's service, is there an experience you can share with us? We were visiting a small branch in a developing country that had been ravaged by decades of civil war. I'd never seen poverty like that before. And one evening, I went into the dining room to gather dinner for us. But before getting the dinner, I stopped and talked to a lovely young brother. At one point, I turned around and noticed that all the food had been taken. And I said, there's no more food. Now, this young brother hadn't eaten either. But he just shrugged and said, it's just hunger, and continued zealously talking about his assignment. Now, this brother was a commuter, very thin, and so it was likely that he might not eat that night or maybe even the next morning. But the way his face glowed when he talked about his assignment, it was uh, clear that his joy was not based on anything physical or the lack of anything physical. So I really treasure this lesson because it's made me want to more appreciate what I do have currently and to imitate his example and focusing on what's truly important. And I think you told me that he did get some food that night. So we're happy about that. Thanks for letting us to get to know you and for sharing that experience. He might not have had any food, but he did get food. <laughs> wow. I mean... Again, without wanting to labour the point too much, this is the annual meeting. This is one of the most auspicious, if not the most auspicious event on the Jehovah's Witness calendar. This is the time to shine for the governing body and for Jehovah's organisation. They're wheeling out not just rank-and-file believers, not just even ordinary Bethelites who haven't married into positions of authority, they're wheeling out this extremely exclusive group of women who are important because of who they've married. And the most compelling story that Sister Snyder has when she's asked to deliver a charming anecdote <laughs> is, oh, well... Um, once we were visiting a poor country and I was in the line in the dining room <laughs> engrossed in conversation with this charming chap who was talking all about his job and as we were talking we didn't notice that there was actually no food on the table that we were in the line for and when I noticed I said oh look there's no food and the guy said, oh, it's just hunger. And he carried on talking about his assignment. That's the best story. In all her years <laughs> of serving in the organization, of rubbing shoulders with the governing body, apparently to the extent where she is an authority on how much they pray <laughs> and to what extent they love the brothers, Despite all of this privileged access to the inner workings of Jehovah's organization, when the spotlight's on her and she's asked to deliver an anecdote, that's the best she's got. I was in a dining room once with someone who was hungry. Um, he seemed quite enthusiastic about his job, so that was very encouraging. <laughs> Oh dear. What is the relevance of that? How is that in any way interesting or meaningful or something that we can derive anything significant from? 
All we've really learned from that experience is that Jehovah's organization isn't very efficient at feeding Bethelites. That's the lesson I'm taking away from that. Because even though he apparently got fed in the end, there was a very real risk that he wouldn't get fed. And his attitude was, oh, it's just hunger. <laughs> it doesn't matter whether I'm starving as long as I'm serving Jehovah's organization. And isn't that the point of everything when it comes to being one of Jehovah's Witnesses? Your own needs come second. Your very life, in fact, comes second. The extent to which you are receiving nutrients into your body comes second when it comes to your privilege of serving Jehovah. <laughs>